So like, there's energy and there's matter, but does energy really matter? I don't know, my brain hurts. The focus of 4.2 is all about energy flow in ecosystems. But before we start, let's not confuse energy flow with matter cycling. In video 4.1, we learned that matter, or nutrients, are cycled and reused in an ecosystem. That cyclical nature only applies to matter and does not apply to energy. Instead of cycling, energy flows through ecosystems, meaning it enters and also exits and cannot be reused. This difference is very important and we will discuss why it exists in this video. So remember, matter cycles in ecosystems and energy flows through ecosystems. Now, onto the important stuff. We now know that energy flows through ecosystems, meaning it enters and exits. So how does it actually enter? The vast majority of ecosystems on our planet get their steady supply of energy from sunlight. The sunlight is converted into chemical energy that exists in carbon compounds through the process of photosynthesis. While this is the norm, there are always exceptions meaning there are some organisms that do not rely on sunlight for energy, but instead rely on a different source. So what are these organisms? They are called chemotrophs. Instead of getting their energy from the sun, like autotrophs do, chemotrophs get their energy from breaking down organic or inorganic molecules within the environment. You will usually find these organisms in hostile environments like volcanic fumaroles, geysers, and deep sea vents. Once chemical energy is harvested by autotrophs or chemotrophs, it can flow through a food chain via the process of feeding. Let's take a look at this simple food chain as an example. The grass is an autotroph, so it uses energy from the sun to create carbon compounds that it can use to make ATP. The grass is making energy for itself to live, and everything is going well, until the grasshopper comes along. The grasshopper is going to eat the grass meaning it will ingest the plant tissue that was storing the carbon compounds for energy. When these carbon compounds are broken down in the grasshopper, the grasshopper can then use the stored energy to make ATP for itself. While much of the energy is used, the grasshopper cells also store compounds for future use. When the mouse comes along and eats the grasshopper, the same thing happens. It steals its carbon compounds and uses them to make energy for itself. And of course, the owl then eats the mouse and the energy is transferred again. Understanding feeding relationships allows ecologists to construct food chains and food webs to better understand how energy moves through an ecosystem. Once energy is obtained by an organism through feeding, Another process must happen in order to make that energy available in the form of ATP. This process is called cellular respiration. As seen in the picture, cellular respiration breaks down carbon compounds, like glucose, to form ATP. ATP is then used to support chemical reactions in the body for growth and homeostasis, both of which have a byproduct of thermal energy, or heat. As energy flows through an ecosystem, there is a large portion of it lost as heat through every step. Unfortunately, living organisms cannot convert heat into other forms of energy. This means, once the energy is converted into heat, it can no longer be used in the ecosystem. Remember when I said energy enters and exits? Well, this is how it exits. Organisms radiate heat into the atmosphere that is lost to the ecosystem. The good news is, we still have sunlight bringing in more energy to support the needs of the communities. But this always begs the question of, well, what happens when the sun burns out, as we know it will at some point? Lucky for us, we don't have to worry about that for another couple billion years. As stated before, energy is lost as it is transferred to the next trophic level of an ecosystem. But how much energy is lost? The general rule is that about 90% of energy is lost from one trophic level to the next. Therefore, 
about 10% of usable energy is transferred. This energy pyramid shows energy quantity in joules as it moves through a food chain. The sun emits very large amounts of energy, so much that primary producers can't use all of it. What they do take, they use it and store it in their tissues. Let's say that's about 10,000 joules of energy within the entire ecosystem. When the primary consumer feeds on the producer, about 10% or 1,000 joules of energy is transferred and can be used, leaving the other 90% lost into the atmosphere primarily as heat. Then the secondary consumer feeds on the primary consumer, again taking 10% of the usable energy, or 100 joules, and leaving 90% lost to the atmosphere. The same process then happens again for the tertiary consumer. The massive amount of energy loss between trophic levels restricts the size of the food chain because the higher up we go, the less energy we have available for the next organisms. For this reason, we will never find more tertiary consumers than secondary consumers in an ecosystem because there's not enough energy available to support larger amounts of biomass. Mm -hmm.